Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to this event. Um, at this event, Daniel Denver is going to be talking to Aziz Rana uh, about the long history of the bipartisan war on immigrants uh, and the intersection of white supremacist and nativist movements with anti-immigrant policy. So the talk is going to focus um, on Dan's recent book, All American Nativism, How the Bipartisan War on Immigrants Explains Politics as We Know It. Um, so I'll quickly introduce the two speakers and then I'll turn things over to Aziz. Um, so Daniel Den Denver is the author of All American Nativism. He's a fellow at Brown University's Watson Institute and host of The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. His journalistic work covers criminal justice, the drug war, immigration, and politics, and has appeared in the New York Times, Jacobin, Vox, The Nation, The Guardian, and elsewhere. And Aziz Rana is professor of law at Cornell Law School and the author of The Two Faces of American Freedom. Um, so just a quick note, you can buy a copy of Dan's book at the Verso website. It's 30% off. There's a little button down below that you can click or you can go on versobooks.com. Um, please post your questions in the chat if you are on Facebook, in the chat if you are on YouTube, and in the chat or in the questions box if you're on Crowdcast. Um, and we'll set aside uh, about 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the event to take questions from the audience. Um, so Aziz is going to be asking Dan some questions for about 45 minutes. Uh, we'll turn to questions from the audience and we'll wrap up by 8.30. Um, this event is also being recorded and it's going to be archived on Verso's uh, YouTube channel and on Jacobin's YouTube channel. Um, I'd love to thank Jacobin for co-sponsoring this event. Um, please follow Verso Books and Jacobin on Facebook and Twitter. There's tons of great events that we're both doing almost every day. Um, so follow us to find out about all of those. Um, also just wanted to let you know that Verso has another event tomorrow, June 5th at five o'clock, um, 5 p.m. Eastern time. It's called Borders, Immobilities and Pandemic Nations. Um, and that features speakers from Australia, Iraq, Mexico and the United Kingdom. Uh, in the US on borders and the politics of mobility. Um, also a quick note that you can get a free copy of The End of Policing by Alex Vitale, um, as well as a free copy of Police, a Field Guide by David Correa and Tyler Wall. Um, both of those eBooks are available now at uh, versobooks.com. Um, okay, I think that is it for housekeeping. Um, I'll turn things over to Aziz. And um, just a note too, that if things start getting a little noisy in the background, I might ask if Aziz and Dan can just mute themselves uh, when they're not speaking. It sounds okay right now, but um, maybe watch the chat and see if there's any uh, if there's any feedback. All right, Aziz, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you. Great. Um, so thanks so much first, Anne, for <clears throat> all your work organizing the event, everybody at, at Verso and Jacobin as well. Um, Thank you to to Dan for uh, writing this terrific book, which is the reason for for us us coming together. Thanks to all of you for taking time um, on your Thursday evening to to spend with us, and so I wish you all good health. and And finally, thank you to all of the people that are on the streets right now and have been over the last week struggling for a, a more just um, future. So what we're going to do um, is we're going to spend probably about um, 10 to 15 minutes with me just giving a kind of overview of the book itself so that everybody is kind of on the same page with the basic arguments of the book. And then um, Dan and I are going to have a conversation uh, maybe for 30 to 45 minutes sort of depends on, on how things go, just kind of working through um, the book and its contemporary meaning. And then we'll open it up um, to questions from you. And I see that there's, this is my first time on on um, Crowdcast, but there's a kind of ask the que a question um, uh, tab that I'll be looking at to just make sure that I can uh, I can respond or we can engage with the questions that you have. Um, anything that you'd like to, to add, Dan, before we jump into it? No, just thanks for, thanks for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. And for reading drafts, multiple drafts of the book. Uh, that's, uh, it was also uh, a pleasure. <clears throat> okay, so um, there are lots of different ways in which the rise of Trump and the Trump presidency has been a shock to the national system. Um, and you know, perhaps the most sort of intense version of that shock is the explicit politics of white supremacy and xenophobia that's come to mark. Um, the Trump administration and Trumpist politics. 
And in many ways, why that's been experienced as a shock is because of the fact that it feels so out of step with how many Americans have understood the relationship between um, national identity and immigration questions of membership. So that the, the, the explicit politics of xenophobia seems to contradict the idea that the US is a nation of immigrants open to all. And so the fact that Trump can win election, hold power with a coalition around a politics that's grounded in exclusion <laughs> seems especially unsettling. And in a way, what Dan does in this book is he argues that, well, we shouldn't think of this as a contradiction at all. He, he contests the framing of this as something that's, you know, a basic underlying tension. Um, and he does it through an act of historical construction that actually diverges from a lot of what critical history generally consists in, including, you know, my own work. So Dan writes, this is on page 16 of the book, that works of social criticism often marshal forgotten histories to recast a normal seeming reality as strange. In other words, they take a present that seems normal and they show by going back to past moments of dislocation and struggle that actually what we take for granted need not have always been the case. But that's not what, what Dan's doing here by highlighting that what you think is a contradiction isn't. He, instead, his book, this book does the opposite, analyzing what for decades was an all too normal anti-immigrant politics to explain how we ended up in such a seemingly bizarre present. In other words, he takes this moment of strangeness and attempts to, to show how it's actually continuous with the past, how it's much more steeped in American identity than we might necessarily think. And he does that, he shows how the contemporary moment around immigration and race politics is actually far more normal than it seems. By how Trump is in many ways a of two long-term historical data. One has to do with the long history really going all the way back, not just to the founding, but to the very earliest days of colonization of settler colonialism and exclusion that was just built in to the politics of membership and migration. So that's one long history. But then there's a second <clears throat> historical trajectory that's sort of essential to, to Dan's argument. And that's that Trump <clears throat> and the contemporary moment is also a culmination of a very specific history that's a product of politics since the 1970s, where you've seen the mainstreaming of nativist sentiment alongside and in a way um, in connection with the rise both of neoliberal austerity and the entrenchment of a carceral state, the latter of which we're seeing being contested on the streets as we speak. And this mainstreaming of nativist sentiment was kind of built around a couple different principles. The first is the idea that really recent immigrants and especially people of, of a Mexican descent are a economic and indeed even a demographic threat that have to be controlled by the state, requires state intervention, a problem that needs to be solved by the state. And the second related point, this is something that really both parties increasingly end up approving of, is the idea that the border is a site that requires protection, that has to be secured, indeed perhaps has to be secured at almost all costs. And what Dan says is that we can see this moment that's being you know, fought out on the streets, but that's also present at the border, as a culmination of both of these long histories. And he makes this argument, he tells the story of how these two histories end up being joined together by constructing the book around four kind of basic concepts. Each concept has an organizing chapter. So this is scarcity, security, empire, both old and new, and then finally reaction. And he tells how each of these conceptual frames through, through the book end up coalescing around what the title then declares as all American nativism. And so in the process, you know, Dan does a number of really remarkable things. So I, you know, I think first and foremost, this book is a tremendous work of um, scholarly and historical synthesis. It's why, you know, I started off by saying it was really, it's been a pleasure to, to read it and to be able to see it in draft. It does a beautiful job of linking what we think of as recent immigration history to a, a longstanding settler past to show how immigration and settler colonialism are in many ways like two sides of the same coin. 
But then it does some other things that I want us to just sort of note up front and maybe we'll be able to get into more and more in, in conversation and question and answer. And that's the fact that the book also makes a series of political interventions explicitly showing what we can think of as really the limitations of both the bipartisan compromise and agreement that emerged post 1970s over immigration and also the limitations of the nativist project how both embody a form of politics that we're seeing unraveling in the present because of their own uh, in, in in inherent um, problems. So what's the issue with the kind of bipartisan approach? The basic bipartisan approach that Dan highlights, and we see this with Bush, uh, the second uh, Bush uh, administration, so Bush Jr., but also with Clinton and, and Obama, was this idea that you can kind of navigate extreme anti-immigrant sentiment and nativist sentiment by having a trade-off where on the one hand you support and back um, border security, um, policing at the border, the militarization of the border, while at the same time assume that if you provide that as um, you know um, a victory for uh, right-wing nativism, then you can get some degree of inclusive politics and policies for those that count as quote unquote good immigrants, including let's say like the dreamers. And what Dan shows in great detail over the last 25, 30 years is that this is just basically a bargain with the devil that inherently fails. In other words, the more militarization you end up uh, supporting, the greater the commitment to border security, um, the greater that that just comes to define and swamp the entire conversation. And so that the benefits of inclusion and reform that you think might be achieved end up being drowned in a larger discourse of militarization. But then there's also an essential problem that nativists have, which is, this is something that, that Dan gets to by the end, which is that the nativist position, and in a way we're seeing this with policing um, right now in real time, is not a position that has majority support. And nativist politics is actually grounded in maintaining this distinction between legal immigration, that's quote unquote good, and quote unquote illegal immigration, that is bad. And so highlighting how the politics of nativism is supposed to be primarily about getting rid of quote unquote illegal immigrants. Of course, this is just, you know, in a sense, um, a cover for a much larger kind of racial purification and demographic project. But there's a basic issue that nativists have as long as they hold on to this dichotomy, which is you can never really get rid of quote unquote illegal immigrants because to eliminate the category would be to eliminate the basic justifications for the policies of militarization in the first place. And so that there's a bit, there's an inherent contradiction. If Dan would reject the idea that there's an inherent contradiction in the American project between sort of exclusion and inclusion, you'd say that there is an inherent contradiction at the heart of nativism. And more generally, there's a kind of basic and profoundly troubled mindset that shapes both the bipartisan approach and the nativist approach, which is a carceral mindset, where really it's the penal system and the security state, the, app, the security apparatus of the state that is supposed to manage the bodies of poor black and brown people. And we're seeing the consequences of that mindset play out on the streets right now. It's why, for example, the fact that Customs and Border Patrol are policing DC is not a surprise, that these two things are deeply and inherently connected. And it means that Dan ends his book by arguing that the only real solution to the contemporary politics of nativism, to all American nativism, is an absolute repudiation of the carceral mindset everywhere, in the city, and at the border. It also means a commitment to decarceration, to decriminalization when it comes to both immigration questions and the larger penal system. And specifically for the condition of migrants, it means a politics of migrant freedom and a rejection in total of the imperative of the border. So with that as just a bit of a background, what I'd like us to do now is kind of dig in to some of the specifics of the argument. And we're gonna kind of work through the book um, and its historical arc. Uh, and maybe we can start, um, Dan, by just talking a little bit about that long history of nativism of which um, Trump is a kind of end point. Um, so where does nativist, if nativist politics is all American, if Trump is not un-American, where does nativism come from? 
like why is it so ingrained in, in sort of the long array of American history? That is a great and, and big question, and maybe the one that I always struggle to answer succinctly because I wanted to initially write a book that was more about the immigration reform wars of the 2000s uh, from the through the Bush and Obama administrations. But then, of course, I realized I needed to go back to the the seventies and the beginning of sort of the militarization of the border as we've come to know it today, and the real construction of uh, of, of Mexican migrants as the iconic quote unquote illegal immigrants and the emergence of 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 the border crisis that exploded so powerfully in the 1990s uh shaping this the 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 the, the early years of this bipartisan war on immigrants beginning under Bill Clinton but then i realized i had to go further back still to to 1965 when the us for the first time explicitly eliminated uh or eliminated explicitly racist immigration laws that had barred asians uh most Asians and explicitly restricted white migrants from disfavored parts of uh, of Europe, people who were seen as not not sufficiently white in a variety of ways in the early 20th century, Italians, Eastern Europeans, Jews. To understand that, I had to go back to the 1920s and the national origins quota laws, which established these explicitly racist immigration quotas and formalized basically a total ban of, of Asians from immigrating to the country. Um, and then further back still to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which coincided with the the first federal immigration control law, the Immigration Act of, of, of 1882. And to understand that, I had to ask, well, why why do the why does this federal immigration system in the uh, emerge and the the the, the anti-Chinese migrant movement peak amidst the the so-called closing, of the Western frontier. And then so to better understand that, <laughs> I had to look at the work of, of, of you know, people like your work, Two Faces of American Freedom, Paul Freimer's amazing book, um, Building This American, Building an American Empire, or This American Empire, I can't remember. I can. uh, yeah. Building an American Empire. And oh, wow, since the very beginning of this country, westward expansion was premised on an explicit racial population politics. Like the people in Washington were you know the settlers wanted to uh the ordinary settlers wanted to rush as far west as fast as they could and the people in in charge in washington had a very explicit debates and and uh decisions around maintaining uh carefully expanding westward so that they could consolidate white majorities as as they moved west and so what 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 that that revealed that i had a complicated story to tell um in in my book and that what we think of as uh, as nativism or xenophobia is just these are like terms to 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 help us think like heuristics to help us think through a particular subset of a broader racist poli racist population politics that have been core to this country from the get-go and from before from the moment of settler the inception of settler colonialism in the country so if if there's this long-standing history that that tells us something that's kind of, that's deep and true about the American approach to migration, so why is it that the most common narrative today about the U.S. is an, is the narrative that the U.S. Um, not only was it founded in principles of liberal equality, but it is a nation of immigrants that's sort of definitionally part of national identity? And so maybe um, tell tell us a little bit about where that argument comes from and how it was sort of given policy teeth in the 1960s. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't um, the the self-conception of of se white settlers in this country at all at the get-go when just a few years after the the revolution, the, the the first naturalization act was was passed that opened citizenship to free white people. And that there was a conception throughout the 19th century um, that this country, the the idea wasn't that this was a nation of immigrants. The idea was that uh, people were coming from certain parts of Europe who were considered co-participants, as you show very clearly in your work, in in the settler colonial project. And so that's why uh, Irish, um, for a variety of uh, 
of reasons were, were targeted in the early parts of the 19th century by states, not by the federal government, by Massachusetts and and uh, New York, but especially Massachusetts. But even still, still, because of the explicit affirmation of white supremacy in the nation's naturalization laws, they suffered deportations and other things. But they never, but but they they could still kind of hold on to legal whiteness. The Chinese Chinese migrants uh, were were not accorded that, and then neither were the Japanese who followed. And the 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 the, the opposition to to Japanese settlement is particularly notable because what a lot of Japanese migrants to the United to the United States were doing was trying to replicate white settler life, build farms, you know, farm homesteads and whatnot. And that uh, since race was a way to legitimate and describe certain types of degraded labor, Japanese migrants uh, essentially impersonating white settler uh, economies and identities and uh, of of independence and economic self-sufficiency posed posed a, a massive threat. Um, and we could go on and on and on, but um, it wasn't until really in the latter days of the national origins quota laws, these are the, this is the period from the 1920s through 1965 that people like the, you know, nativist goblin, evil genius advising Trump, Stephen Miller are so intent on returning to from the 19, uh, from 1921, when the first, uh, I think it was the emergency quota act was passed this year through 1965, when they were repealed uh, by LBJ with the Hart Seller Act. Um, that uh, it was the, 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 the latter decades of, 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 of that era, that um, this idea of the nation of immigrants began to emerge for the first time, and Matthew Fry Jacobson um, and uh, and May Nye both both discuss this in different ways in in their works. But it was only then, as 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 the New Deal in many ways had incorporated the 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 the, the more newly arriving white white immigrants from the turn of the century, the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, Italians, Poles, you know. Catholics more more generally had incorporated them into whiteness through the achievements of of the of the New Deal at the height of the the Cold War with the upsurge of the civil rights movement that um, that this this the, this new story about who the United States what the United States was and who who the United the American people were and are emerged and that idea. Um, as as Matthew Fry Jacobson points out, uh, I think I think he uses this language, move the origin story of this country from Plymouth Rock to Ellis Island, which prior to this period to the '60s had not had not been considered a uh, you know kind of like a tourist attraction. Yeah, um, indeed. One of the things. And, and let me. And, uh, sorry, one, one other thing, and, and and what that relocation does. Is uh, the, you know the story of of the nation of immigrants as as JFK articulates it very very famously in his book. Um, it's a story of all of these white ethnic immigrants, more or less, who were very much discriminated against and targeted for restriction in the early 20th century, but who had become white and then telling the the story of the Amer of American history and of the American people as their story, um, which uh, which doesn't really explain much about why why black people who were brought to this country in in chains why they're here how indigenous people who uh were whose dispossession was the fundamental precondition for this country where they fit in and where and where and where and where mexicans who were brought to this country as as the cheap labor source during the whole national origins quota era era through the bracero programs but also many crossing without authorization where they fit into this story and indeed with the 1965 repeal of the national origins quota quotas there are first ever what follow what what accompanies and then follows that are the first ever restrictions and increasingly sharp restrictions on legal mexican migration which had been institutionalized in a massive way bringing millions of mexican migrants to this country over the prior decades and what that does is suddenly the law and G even gerald ford president gerald ford understood that this was what, what was going to happen um the mexican migration continued but was illegalized and it was the nation the liberal nation of immigrant story that created this good immigrant bad immigrant narrative and facilitated the legitimation of the legalization of mexican migration yeah so the, the, this is really interesting so the the great policy achievement of the the kind of mid 20th century nation of immigrants idea that we're really familiar with is the hart seller act 
And that's something that's, you know, oftentimes celebrated um, alongside, you know, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. It comes down in 1965. It's thought of as part of the same civil rights movement. And what it does is it ends racially restrictive um, quotas in the U.S. But at the same time, the thing that you're noting is for the first time in American history, it places the Western Hemisphere, and, and here the, the central country really is Mexico, on a quota system. And so m maybe say a little bit more about like what that latter move does in terms of kind of reconfiguring the na nature of migration politics in the US and also um, how it um, alongside kind of erasing questions of indigeneity and slavery, that it's a, a, f a framing um, that fundamentally misunderstands the relationship between the US and Mexico. Like how does it erase the history specifically of the US and Mexico? Yeah, well, just to, to to maybe I alluded to this in my my last answer, but the 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 nativists of the the early twentieth century they didn't want the organized nativists they wanted uh, Asians barred they they won that they wanted Eastern and Southern European uh, heavily restricted they won that they basically wanted to like freeze the American uh, demography in in place or even wind it back in time they. They didn't want Mexicans coming either, but there were incredibly powerful business interests in the Southwest, the growers in the rapidly industrializing, uh, you know, agricultural industry of the Southwest who demanded Mexican labor. And it was more or less a compromise between the nativists and the growers that um, allowed for the Western Hemisphere to be exempt from all of this. And this was premised on an idea that 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 Mexicans would not come to to stay, that they would that they would visit. And never put down roots here, and like be I, there's there was some famous, uh, infamous quote that I reference in my book. I can't remember precisely right now, but basically describes them as migratory birds who will return back to to their home. But uh, so th th there's massive recruitment of Mexican labor, and then with World War II and the massive demand for labor that accompanies that, there's the Bracero program between growers, the U.S. government, and the Mexican government, which which legally and intentionally brings millions of, of Mexican workers into the U.S. to as, as temporary workers who are welcomed as, as laborers, but uh, not welcomed very much as, at all as, as, as citizens, as human beings. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's sort of like an insourcing of, of labor instead of, of an outsourcing, and that um, comes to an end in 1964, I believe the year that b before Hart Seller is is passed. And then in 1965, you have the first ever um, Western Hemisphere uh, quota ceiling. But then what's really significant is the 1976 law that puts uniform annual uh, visa uh, caps on every country in the world. So whether you're Belgium, you know, who we don't have like any particular that I can recall migration relationship with in 1965 or Mexico, where we have an institutionalized economic, deep economic labor market integration and social networks that are bringing uh, uh, every year large numbers of Mexican workers into the US. Suddenly, I believe the, the number is 20,000. Suddenly there's 20,000 visas for legal migration from, uh, uh, for, for Mexicans and for Belgians. And so this is facially rac racially neutral. Like, okay, yeah, we don't have anything in the law anymore that says no Chinese. Um, but effectively what it's doing is saying, uh, is just criminalizing this massive swath of Mexican migrants. But what the nation of immigrants story does is says, uh, well, we, we're a nation of, of, of immigrants, which means that we accept uh, good immigrants because our country's built on immigrants and obviously as we just discussed that invisibilizes all kinds of things like 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 uh slavery being the basis of the country indigenous dispossession but what it also does is say that basically uh good good immigrants are welcome here and um mexican migrants who are suddenly illegalized in mass by this legal change don't fit in there and so you see the you know Despite the, the, the fact that you have long-standing communities that were really built on both sides of the border um, that were connected to you know uh, labor patterns migration networks overnight all of a sudden that's now against the law essentially 
Yeah. And we could also mention that uh, a huge part of the U.S. was the northern half of Mexico before the mid 19th century, which is invisibilized uh, many times over <laughs> throughout the years. So, uh, so this is a really interesting moment where you both have reform that gets rid of racially restrictive quotas, but you also have policies that treat, as you said, you know, Mexican immigrants as equivalent in their structural relationship to the U.S. as like immigrants from Belgium or you know Bhutan or just name any particular country that you might want. And this double move, in a sense, creates the the conditions for really the the more um, compact history from the 70s to the present that you chart in the book. So, you know, how is it that modern immigration policy that starts in the 60s, that's really established with this uniform quota system in 76, ends up feeding the rise of, of contemporary nativism? Yeah. So you have this temp, the good immigrant, bad Im immigrant template, and you have the, the, the illegality pretext to, uh, describe opposition to Mexican migration and anti-immigrant sentiment becomes, uh, more, more intense in the 1970s as the, the sort of Im ambitions and optimism and even really like utopianism of the great society collapses into an incredible sense of pessimism and scarcity with, with the oil shock and stagflation and extremely high unemployment. It's no coincidence that at that very same time, one of the biggest books in uh, the very tail end of the, the 60s, I think it's 68 or 9, is The Population Bomb, which argues that population growth left unchecked is going to lead to chaos, famine. It was an enormous bestseller at the time. And lo and behold, it doesn't, it turns out not what, what really resonates is not so much a abstract concern with the number of people on, on the planet, but a concern with, with very, the number of, of, of people from very particular groups and the reproduction of women's reproduction from very particular groups. And so it's out of, of that milieu that springs this uh, group, uh, zero population growth, which is an, which, which is anti-immigrant, but also concerned with all sorts of other uh, methods to achieve population control. And one of the guys who ends up running it is this ophthalmologist from Michigan named John Tanton. And they're not anti-immigrant enough for him. So he goes on in 1979 to, to found the Federation for American Immigration Reform, and then over the years goes on to found or play a role in founding every major national anti-immigrant organization that we know today, the Center for Immigration Studies, Numbers USA, US English. And what, even though there's like massive anti-immigrant sentiment in the country, turning that into a consequential form of politics is not, it, it, he finds out, the movement finds out is not, the activists find out is not automatic even though there's all this anti-immigrant sentiment, not only among white Americans, but among Hispanic Latino Americans, among black Americans, but it's not a voting issue. It's not a kind of culture war issue that pits the two parties against each other. And that begins to, to change. And what, what they use is um, they use language and, and you, and English only laws, which are extremely successful beginning with the San Francisco ordinance in the 1980s to make English the official language followed by a, statewide proposition. And then in the 1990s, it really explodes uh, using this whole uh, framework of the good immigrant and the bad immigrant and the bad immigrant being the illegal immigrant, because an illegal immigrant is someone who is inherently criminal. So when this really explodes with California at its epicenter uh, in, in the early 90s, it's around the illegality of border crossing. It's around immigrants posing a criminal threat. It's about immigrants posing a an economic and fiscal threat because they are uh, attempting to access jobs and public benefits to which they have no right because of their illegality. And this is obviously heavily and explicitly racialized, but it's the liberal nation of immigrants framework that presents the good immigrant as the legal immigrant and the bad immigrant as the quote unquote illegal immigrant that allows for all of this to happen. And it immediately, from the very beginning, is a bipartisan affair. And in California, as a brief example, featuring uh, gov the Republican governor, Pete Wilson, 
demagoguing in favor of the anti-immigrant Proposition 187, which would have denied uh, uh, public services to undocumented immigrants, including public education to undocumented children. Um, he demagogically hitching his reelection campaign to that and winning, but also Dianne Feinstein at the time, who was a U.S. senator, Democratic U.S. senator from California, still is, who had lost the gubernatorial election to Wilson a few years back. Also, the Clinton administration, who at the very time, same time that some extremely hardcore right wing nativists and Pete Wilson were pushing this radical anti-immigrant proposition in California at the very same time, were embarking on a dramatic escalation in border militarization beginning in at the El Paso Ciudad Juarez border with Operation Hold the Line and then continuing uh, on like the eve, like just a few weeks, I think, before the vote on Proposition 27, unroll, un unfolding this massive escalation in border militarization in San Diego with Operation Gatekeeper. Yeah, so that by the time we get to the 90s, there's a really interesting kind of two part story. So one part of it has to do with these policies <clears throat> and practices that you're describing. So the growing militarization of how um, the federal government, even the states um, are approaching the question of immigration. You have Prop 187 in California, you have ORIRA and um, <clears throat> the you know federal immigration reform bill that passes in 96 that's not vetoed and so signed into law um, by Clinton that essentially means that um, immigrants even that are lawful residents now live on a kind of permanent probation in the US because of the the vast expansion of the number of like crimes that could make you deportable, um, mandatory deportation, um, harsh uh, border enforcements. Um, so all of these policies are taking place in the mid 1990s. And at the same time, there's a background let's say, conversation, elite media conversation that's taking place about race and immigration that's sort of feeding this discussion that sort of, that draws from the edges of nativist politics, but now you're seeing sort of being expressed in the New York Times, the New Republic, the Atlantic, sort of the legacy institutions that we associate with, um, with liberal or let's say now like centrist America. Um, and so I'd like us to talk a little bit about both. Maybe we can start with the background kind of media conversation of that era. One of the things that I found really striking about reading your book were just the number of pieces um, that were explicitly kind of xenophobic um, and racist that were published in, you know, mainstream press settings um, and that seemed to just circulate pretty widely in the 1990s. You know, we have figures today that are viewed as, you know, extreme figures of the right, like Dinesh D'Souza, that were getting, you know, massive and indeed like glowing reviews in, you know, in places like the New York Times. So what is a it lengthy about the cover story that era? Go ahead. Dinesh D'Souza had a lengthy, a liberal education, an excerpt from it, I believe, um, which was one of his first books, was published as a lengthy which was, you know, condemning, you know, the the the, the PC rule of, of of American universities and colleges was initially published uh, as a an excerpt of it as a very long cover story in the Atlantic. So, yeah. So what, what's going on in the politics of the '90s, which we tend to think of now as this era of kind of like a sort of anodyne centrist consent? consensus where the arguments like racist demagogic arguments from the right on immigration and race including you know Charles you know, like Murray and the bell curve and all of this kind of stuff is getting mainstream attention um, and how is that setting the terms for the conversation yeah and that's a really good question and I'm not sure I answer like why this all happens adequately in the book and you and I have discussed this um, on on occasion over over the years but for First, first, just to, to set some of the the political context, um, as he's referred to a few a, a few laws, IRA, IRA, EDPA, uh, in I think both were passed in 1996, if I remember um, yeah. correctly, yeah. and and both um, were. It, it, it's notable that that the two most important anti-immigrant laws, I think it's safe to say, federal laws of the 1990s, were also. Um, kind of mass incarceration, uh, cr criminal justice oriented laws, and that both linked 
the immigration the, the 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 once more civil immigration enforcement system linked it ever more closely to the criminal justice system and i mean that's like what was happening on the policy level and on a political level uh increasingly identified the immigrant problem as one of immigrants being a criminal threat so it's notable that that the war on crime which of cr course was what was premised on the pathologization and demonization of black people was also part of the war on immigrants, which was premised on the pathologization and demonization of immigrants as criminal threats. So these are deeply interlinked. It's also notable that both Prop 187 and the welfare reform law signed by Clinton 96 attacked immigrants' access to welfare, which we, as everyone listening, I'm sure, knows welfare reform was the the way to that the path to that was smoothed by the pathologization of 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 black women black single women on welfare in particular um but uh but the pathologization of of, of immigrant women particularly latino women particularly in places like california also played a key a key role in in in, in that reaction so in terms of both the reactionary welfare politics and the reactionary law and order security politics of the 1990s we see that the anti-immigrant and anti-black forces just fundamentally interlinked at almost every moment. Um, and I think that's re revealing and maybe not discussed enough. Um, and then, okay, so the media environment at the time was, um, I think, pretty well encapsulated by Dinesh D'Souza's uh, Atlantic cover story from, I don't know the date off the top of my head, I should bring my book with me to interviews, but I think it's around 1992, or something, and it's uh, it, it's 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 all about this attack on PC culture. The thing is, is that people on the left really weren't using the term PC. Liberals even weren't using the term, or left liberals weren't using the term PC. It was a, a kind of new, new liberal, new Democrat, neoliberal, and conservative um, uh, framework for delegitimating the historic demands of of left struggles, and it was actually. Uh, invented, if I remember correctly, by a New York Times writer around 1990, 1991. Don't, uh, uh, the date could be totally wrong, but thereabouts. Um, it was invented by the same New York Times writer who, uh, in a book review in a few years later, would give this glowing review to a book uh, called Alien Nation by Peter Brimlow, which was put out by a major New York, you know, major U.S. pub commercial publisher. I don't remember the name. Maybe uh, I'm not going to uh, um, smear any <laughs> publishers, but it was because <laughs> I can't remember. It was a big one, and he gave this glowing review to this book, Alien Nation, which was just monstrously and explicitly racist, and itself was based on a cover story in the National Review, but was turned into a book, and. Uh, they called Hispanics a strange anti-nation within the nation and said that people have a right to, uh, you know, uh, demand uh, that they preserve the demographic norms in this country and that indeed they have a right to demand that they be shifted back. I mean, a very white, explicitly, not, you know, explicitly white supremacist, anti-immigrant book that was reviewed glowingly in the New York Times by the same guy who invented PC as an epithet and reviewed glowingly um, in in the Atlantic and, and many other um, uh, places. And this was also uh, the, you know, the era when the New Republic was publishing an excerpt of of the bell curve, which argued that that black people and and Latinos um, were were genetically inferior. To, to white people. And it was the attack on kind of like PC culture that legitimated this resurgence of naked racism because the idea was that like the the the, the PC left was had gone so far that they were uh what what PCness meant and continues to mean it, it is uh is is that certain orthodoxies blind people to the 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 facts and then they get to present themselves as these brave truth tellers who are violating, you know, these uh, these unfortunate taboos, and uh, and lo and behold, the guy who wrote Alien Nation, who you know, who was glowingly reviewed in these mainstream liberal publications like the New York Times, who got a start at the national 
review who published this book, he goes on in, I think, 1999 or so to found the website VDARE, um, one of the most important white nationalist websites on the internet, unsettled, unsubtly named after uh, Virginia Dare, purportedly the first white child born in North America, um, and is now openly considered by, you know, liberal media types to be a white supremacist. But the, the crazy thing is that he was just that in the 1990s and was feted. And it's disgusting, but um, it, it, it's kind of what you were talking about in your um, introduction to this conversation. Um, you know, why I want to make the normal seeming path and past this normal past that so many liberals are so adamant about returning to, according to the, the primary, we're still somehow in the midst of that that past was actually like really, really strange um, and pretty monstrous frequently. Mm. So maybe let's dig into that a little bit by um, by sort of talking a bit about the the policy and the kinds of choices that the Democratic Party made around immigration and policing um, more generally during the 1990s. So as you noted, <clears throat> the central bills that dealt with immigration, so EDPA and ORIRA in 96, are really bills that are about um, incarceration in the carceral state. They're about applying a security at the state security apparatus as a way of controlling migrant populations and creating what now amounts to a massive new sort of category of deportable people. So it's mm -hmm. it's the period in which the U.S. in the you know mid 1990s goes from having an already aggressive and racialized immigration system to to being essentially the deportation nation that it becomes, um, you know, during the Bush and Obama years. Um, now. That's obviously a link between nativism and the contemporary problems that we're seeing play out on the streets around policing, the security apparatus and mass incarceration. And it's marked by, let's say, the same compromise that Democratic politicians made um, around questions of race and policing. They're making the same compromise in the immigration context. In other words, folks like Clinton, you know, with Orira in 96, like they're not the ones that wrote the bill. But, you know, Clinton is not willing to veto it. It's a policy of triangulation, but it's an assessment that you have to be tough on the border. You have to support border security in this broader climate in order to be able to get the kind of reform objectives that you want. It's but the same less assessment. Sadistic than Republicans. <laughs> uh, uh, but, go ahead. But somewhat less sadistic than Republicans. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same basic... Um, psychology, like, you know, internal party psychology that produces the Crime Control Act in 94, which is you have to show that you're tough on crime um, in order to be able to get any of the kinds of racial reforms that you might want. Um, what do we make of that kind of pragmatic compromise around the carceral state, both in terms of policing and in immigration that we saw in the 90s? And what's its legacy today? Because in many ways, the Democratic Party is still controlled by politicians from that period, Biden, Schumer, um, Feinstein, you know, Pelosi, these are all politicians that were shaped by a set of dynamics from the 90s and have continued to essentially hold the same basic, um, you know, um, dual positions where you have to be strong on security while at the same time have some kind of space for, uh, for reform. What do we make of that? you know, that worldview then, and what do we think of its kind of legacy now? All right, I'm gonna try to uh, get from here to, from that from there to here. Uh, so, I mean, in the 90s, there are real problems that 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 people are, are facing. You can't kind of like manufacture, um, it's hard to manufacture racist scapegoating out of, out out of thin air. So the material they're working with in the early '90s is there is there is real disorder in the streets, as James Foreman Jr. shows in his book. Crime crime is up, and in the absence of any sort of social state amid Reaganism and the rise of of New Democrats, um, you know the much 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 of the public, including uh, much of the black public, turns to 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 policing and prisons as the answer in part because it's the only <laughs> answer they're, they're they're given and and that is sort of a microcosm of the the broader politics of the the era which is a, a bipartisan effort on the part of both new democrats 
and Republicans to shift every conflict possible onto the terrain of security. And thanks to Rahm Emanuel, we have proof that at least he was very intentionally thinking about it like this. Because at the moment, there's incredible anxiety at the end of with the Cold War's end and the rise of this unipolar world order that coincides with a new era of intensifying economic globalization exemplified for Americans by the negotiation, signing, and then implementation of NAFTA, which also, of course, involves the Mexican border. And so what what Rahm Emanuel says in a memo to, to Bill Clinton, I think in 95 or 96, is if we want to con maintain continued public support for legal trade with Mexico, which is referring to NAFTA, then we need to make a show, I'm paraphrasing here, we need to make a show of cracking down on illegal trade or illegal cross-border activities, i.e. people and drugs. And so the performance of, of security, both on the streets in terms of the politics of the war on crime and mass incarceration and at the border are both key to recontextualizing every possible conflict two decades into the rise of neoliberalism and the stagnation of wages and the you know it's financialization of american capitalism to redefine every conflict possible as a security one and of course this only intensifies after 9 11 when um you know th there was anti kind of anti-terrorism politics in form 1990s nativism and security politics more generally but obviously that comes to another level entirely so it's After. not just that nat nativism is connected to the rise of mass and hyper incarceration, but it's also tied to the politics of endless war. So that this, yeah. you know, security yeah. politics you're seeing operating in the city, at the border, and then abroad. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, and just this is a little bit out of order, but one thing that I should probably probably mention is that something I make a point of doing in my book is arguing that nativism and anti-immigrant politics focused on anti-immigrant politics as we understand them being the, the the politics of opposing international migration and international migrants, people from other borders, is basically inseparable from this larger racial population politics, very much focused on race in place um, mm -hmm. and, and, and human movement, uh, very yeah. much including domestic migration um, from the, the 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 fears over in the north, over uh, the end of slavery, meaning black migration to the north, animating, making um the, the 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 voluntary and or forced colonization of black people outside of the united states the 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 mainstream anti-slavery opinion for for a time to when the great migration actually happens in the 20th century um resist white resistance to to black migrants being um you know co core to the the entirety of 20th century U.S. politics, the resistance to the integration of, of, of neighborhoods, schools, and job sites across the entire North and West. Um, anyhow. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, you know, continuing with the story, so you sort of charted the path from the 90s through the, the early 2000s with the war on terror. And in a way, you know, what I was hearing you saying was that the kind of um, pragmatic conclusions that Clintonites ended up making about immigration, which is you have to be tough on uh, on border security as a way of being able to hold this uh, this tension between bad quote unquote illegal immigrants and good legal migration, and in a context in which you're trying to also preserve the flow of capital. Um, globally through various trade agreements like NAFTA, um, that that made a kind of um, both political sense at election time, but also ideological sense for where the Democratic Party was. Um, the Democratic Party uh, today and really over the last decade is increasingly, at least the base, has moved in a different direction. What do we make of the legacy, the long-term legacy of that kind of pra that set of pragmatic conclusions that in many ways still still seems to govern the leadership of the national party who are all politicians shaped by the politics of the 80s and 90s yeah i mean it, one one thing that's very clear from this period and that's detailed exhaustively and beautifully in lily geismer's uh book don't blame us which is on the 
rise of of Atari and New Democrats in uh, focusing specifically on the Route 128 suburbs of Massachusetts is, you know, there's this whole this whole idea that that the Democratic establishment is sort of economically moderate, but socially liberal, which is just like entirely backwards because it's precisely when the Democratic Party is substituting it's uh, displacing its working class base uh, in favor of, of of knowledge workers and suburbanites that it also takes such a hard turn towards mm. towards security politics. Um, and uh, so uh, g- give me a, a prompt for that. Rest yeah. Of so so I, I guess the thought here is that, you know, um, there was a way in which the lessons that yeah. the Democrats learned in the 90s about the need to be right. be tough right. on security in all of these contexts, right. which is really central to, right. uh, you know, austerity, the carceral state, the defunding of uh, welfare reform, um, the support for like interventionism abroad, the securitizing of the right. border. There's an entire right. vision um, that in a sense, made electoral sense for, for Clinton. Clinton gets reelected in 96. You know, he he passes into law welfare reform in these various bills and wins re-election. Um, that's, that legacy, though, has had much longer right. legs than the particular electoral conditions of that era. It's yeah. still, you know, you're seeing it being contested in the streets in a way to just put a fine point on it. This is not an original point. This is something that a lot of people have been saying right now. You know, many of the cities they're facing mass uprisings are controlled at virtually every level by Democrats, but in a way by Democrats that learn the same lessons that Clinton learned <clears throat> about both immigration and, and um, you know, and, and incarceration in the 90s, but now don't seem like either lessons that are appropriate for the, the electoral moment or the political time. So what do we make of the legacy of those choices? Yeah. Um- so when the 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 war on Im- the bipartisan war on immigrants was launched with a bipartisan popular basis it had if you look at public opinion polling in the early 90s you have similar uh very high number of, of similar very high percentages of democrats and republican voters who have negative feelings who report negative feelings towards immigration generally and so in the 1990s between then and now, we go from very little fencing on the U.S. border to uh, more than 650 miles, I believe, when Trump takes office, particularly thanks to the Secure Fence Act of 2006, signed into law by George W. Bush, but supported in the Senate by Obama, Biden, Clinton. We go from, I think, around 4,000 or so Border Patrol agents in 1993 to nearly 20,000 today. And that whole process takes off with bipartisan support. But what we begin to see in the 2000s is a uh, really important uh, process of, 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 of conflict and, polar, and, and partisan polarization around immigration. In when immigration reemerges as a big explicit issue around 2004, 2005, um, after it had been kind of displaced politically uh, by 9-11, even as 9-11 ra- led to the ramping up of institutional means of anti-immigrant and, uh, and, and, and border enforcement, when it reemerges in 2004, 2005, Bush was trying to push comprehensive immigration reform. And Obama would try to do the same too. This idea that, okay, we have these nativists on the right who they want all the immigrants gone. We have business, they want cheap labor, guest workers in particular, but they're into immigration of all sorts. And we have immigrant advocacy groups who want legalization of the millions of undocumented immigrants in this country. And uh, when Bush tries to push this, he meets a ferocious response from the nativist right, because he doesn't understand that they will not vote for any thing that will legalize a single immigrant in this country, because that's their whole point is is that uh, is is, is to expel all uh, undocumented immigrants. They wouldn't legalize anyone. So Bush um, Bush is pushing this uh, quixotically, and House Republicans come up with their own bill, the Sensenbrenner bill, which passes the House of Representatives in December 2005. And it breaks the rules of the bipartisan war on immigrants, which has since the 1990s been about the, the security theater 
the spectacular performance performance of repressive state power that's intended to convey to the American people that the border is secure and thus that their world and lives are becoming secure. Obviously, that doesn't happen. The performance always fails. And when it does fail, instead of reexamining the basic logic of the security theater, they're just calls to heighten and escalate and do more security. But in 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 2000, but it doesn't actually mess with the actual existence of a massive undocumented workforce in this country, which the Sensenbrenner bill would do because it would criminalize mere undocumented presence in this country, which then and now remains a civil offense that is remedied, quote unquote, through deportation, uh, but not uh, uh, but it's not a criminal offense that you will serve time for crossing the border without authorization that's illegal entry or illegal reentry but mere undocumented presence civil offense the sensenbrenner bill would have not only criminalized that but criminalized aiding undocumented immigrants which many worried would criminalize the activities of like catholic charities and so that passes the house it goes nowhere in the senate but what it does do is prompt massive just enormous immigrant rights protests to explode May Day protests in 06 throughout 2006 yeah Mar there's some in March, I believe, then in April, and then on May Day, I think were the largest. And they're enormous, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, I believe like 500,000 maybe in LA, same in Chicago, New York, everywhere. I was in Portland, Oregon at the time. Um, and so what we see taking, and, and this is uh, visible in the, in, the, um, in, in the polling data, is we begin to see a partisan divergence over immigration. And that's pushed by both the extreme increasing radicalization of anti-immigrant Republicans and the fact that 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 the immer the, the the immigrants who form such a important part of the base, immigrants of color who form such a particularly Latinos, particularly Latinos who form such an important part of the Democratic base, that they rise up and say enough with this. And then from there on out, um uh you see the polarization increasing. You see it taking on uh, increasing under Obama when Obama achieves record deportations, by the way, by using the criminal justice system. That's his main method, both by charging people, uh, both by formally deporting people at the border and charging them with the, the federal misdemeanor of illegal entry and the federal felony of illegal reentry by using this program called Secure Communities, which uses uh, basically this fingerprint database from the FBI and merges it with, with one from ICE so that every single jail in the country becomes a front door to the deportation pipeline, uh, through 287 G, which was authorized by IRA, IRA, um, the, the Clinton era law, which allows, uh, which facilitates the deputization of, of cops and sheriffs, uh, and jails all over this country as ICE agents, including people like Joe Arpaio. Um, the Maricopa County, the former Maricopa County Sheriff in Arizona. Um, and so Obama achie achieves record deportations and as a response prompts another movement led by particularly Latino youth, immigrant youth, immigrants in general, immigrant youth, um, against this deportation agenda. And then we see that increasing the polarization, even as Obama's efforts to crack down on on undocumented immigrants and to perform for the right wing that just like George Bush did, George W. Bush did, that this, I, this idea that if they could uh, uh, you know, convey to the nativist right in Congress and, and on Fox News or whatever, that they were serious about enforcing the border, that the nativist right would be reasonable and come around to supporting comprehensive immigration reform. That obviously never happens because Bush and Obama are unilaterally pursuing a policy of nativist anti-immigrant escalation, both in the interior and at the border. And so even, even if the right-wing nativists were like logical, which I mean, they're probably not, but if they were, why would they ever compromise for comprehensive immigration reform when they're getting the standalone nativist uh, enforcement escalation from both George W. Bush, a purported immigration moderate, and Barack Obama, a purported friend of uh, of immigrants and champion of legalization, and so that uh, culminates in the election of, of Trump, where the Overton window on immigration enforcement has moved so far to the right that for many people on the right, the only escalation left that makes sense is a literal 
hermetic ceiling of the entire southern border of of the nation. And, and now the White House itself. And now the White House itself. And so suddenly the entire kind of normal history that had preceded it um, is um, appears as something a lot more sinister. Yeah, so that that was uh, you know that was really helpful in just kind of charting the path basically from um, the 2000s through to the present. And you know one of the things that's that's interesting about the present that's tied to that party polarization around the question of immigration is the fact that you know the Trump agenda and the nativist position is itself you know it has a clear base. It was a base that Trump was able to use. Um, to to get elected, but it's it's increasingly a minority position, and popular sentiment around immigration. Um, this is something that you note toward the end of the book has changed quite dramatically since the 1990s. Something like you know Prop 187 that gets almost 60 percent of the support in California uh, in '94. You know would never get that kind of support. You know today, and this has a lot to do with you know, the internal position within the Democratic Party, shifts in perspective. But I guess the question that I want to ask probably you... More children, they're probably more children of undocumented immigrants in the California State Assembly than, than supporters of Proposition 187 today. There you go. <laughs> so the question that I wanted to ask you is, if this moment in a way shows the limits of Trump's politics, and indeed even the limits of the kind of bipartisan agreement um, that marked the, the 90s and the 2000s, um, you know, how progressive ultimately though is our current immigration conversation? So that there's, there's obviously there was mass resistance to the Muslim ban, there's support for the dreamers, there's concern about like the violence perpetrated by ICE. There was, you know, outrage about the um, the caging of caging and disappearing of children, the separation of families at the border. Um, but um, you know, beyond a, a certain kind of uh, moral concern, um, how far has the politics actually moved? And um, and I'm interested in your thoughts about this because I'd then like to just ask you to sort of explicitly compare what we're seeing with immigration politics with the the contemporary conversation around police reform but maybe just start with you know this question of how how progressive is this current moment around immigration specifically yeah it, it, it's a complicated question because the 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 breakdown in the bipartisan basis of for the war on immigrants presents both opportunities and and dangers the opportunities were were visible in the Democratic primary, which is technically still going on right right now, I suppose. Um, we're de decriminalizing illegal entry, which is a, a a felony whose prosecution skyrocketed under the, the the Bush and Obama presidencies. We're decriminalizing illegal entry, which had been on the books, I believe, since 1929, um, which has a fascinating history that we don't have time to get into. But uh, doing that became a kind of litmus test for supporting immigrant rights. Um, and that's huge because that is the policy, not only that Obama and Bush used so much in their crackdown, but that Trump used to uh, to impose family separations. And that would have been hard to imagine in 2016, let alone 2012, 2008. I mean, in 2006 or something, I don't remember the exact year, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, when she was a senator from New York, said, you know, I am adamantly against illegal immigration and complained about having to see day laborers on corners around around New York. I mean, the polit the, the the political center of gravity um, uh, sh on this question within the Democratic Party shifted enormously, and that's absolutely like no credit to most of the politicians, but just of the wh where people are at has forced um, politicians to to uh, respond. Um, and then in Bernie Sanders' platform, which was very good on immigration. Um, there was a there was a, a, a pledge for a moratorium um, of sorts on on deportations, which was huge, and critically, a pledge to end these the the, the crimmigration system these these tight links between the criminal justice and immigration enforcement system that have been developed that have been developed over the the prior decades, ending the two eighty seven G program, ending secure communities. So that's that's the the optimistic side that's the opportunity side we've we don't yet know what that'll look like with um a uh fossil 
preserved from that era of the war on immigrants and crimes like Joe Biden as a Democratic president, like what that'll look like in practice. But um, the primary gives me some hope that things are that that a Democratic president this year, even a shitty one like Joe Biden, will be better than Obama was on this issue. And again, no, that's not any praise for Joe Biden. That's praise for the politics that are changing the conditions within which a Democratic president operates. The dangers, um, of course, are that um, the Republicans are increasingly unhinged in their anti-immigrant politics. The, the the most kind of revealing polling I've seen on that is since Trump's election, the number of Republicans who who believe, uh, this is a Pew survey, uh, who believe that immigration uh, poses a threat to like our national identity, you know, a very unsubtle kind of like racism in xenophobia test question has gone considerably up since Trump's election amongst Republicans. And we're also, uh, you know, the popular politics of this Aside, what we're seeing from the Trump administration is not only an intensification of the war on undocumented immigrants, but an attempt to finally thread the needle on what the nativist movement has always wanted and what the war on undocumented immigrants was always supposed to be um, the, the means to the end of, which is uh, an end to all immigration as, as we've known it. And Stephen Miller and others in the administration have been very smart and sophisticated about using every administrative lever at their disposal to uh, choke off legal immigration, whether it's refugee resettlement or, uh, you know, just uh, just green cards. Um, uh, and even before so even before this pandemic, we had seen a significant decrease in the annual number of legal immigrants coming to the country. And now with the pandemic, the Trump administration has taken advantage of the the kind of de facto and and uh, formal uh, shutdowns and cross border movement to issue an executive order suspending immigration, not just on public health, but also on economic grounds. And given the Supreme Court's rationale for uh, rubber stamping the the what was it, the third Muslim band? because Trump said it was for national security and yeah, president could do whatever they want because of national security. Because of that, I'm very pessimistic that if Trump cites national security because the global South is being ravaged by coronavirus, I'm very, uh, in terms of defending his suspension of immigration, targeting particular countries, um, I'm not optimistic that it will, uh, that the courts would, would, would block, would stop him from doing that and then the last thing I'll say in terms of uh, of problems is just in the same way with mass incarceration that we've seen uh, this thing that that people call um, sentence inflation happen, where uh, you know uh, like twenty five to life for a, a, a murder used to be normal in the U.S. and and then um, you know you 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 could expect to get paroled or or your sentence commuted at some point. Um, uh, along the way, the the increase in sentences for every sort of crime has made sentences that were once deemed harsh and appropriate to to certain crimes, including violent crimes, make make them now, in retrospect, seem uh, seem too light and weak and insufficient to the severity of the crime. So, with with criminal justice reform, we're seeing a lot of the low hanging fruit being picked around. You know, legalizing marijuana um, pushes to to you know decriminalize or stop enforcing or stop incarcerating people for all sorts of quote unquote nonviolent crimes. But uh, the third rail is still reform around around violent crimes, um, which has been a huge driver of mass incarceration. And a big part of that is because the 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 extremely long sentences, including the explosion of life without parole, these have been normalized and are very hard to backtrack on without um and so the same things happened with with immigration it's now normal to have you know 20 odd thousand border patrol agents even though we only had like four thousand or so um three decades ago um the politics of 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 actually you know getting ri i mean you know open borders is like my utopian uh guide star or whatever the the term is north star but i mean just you know a more pragmatic radical question of how we cut the size of the border patrol 
by 75% or whatever, so that it, it is where it was, um, three decades ago, that seems incredibly hard because there's this normalization, this normalization, um, and kind of institutional path dependency of the politics surrounding repressive, repressive apparatuses of the state. Same with the border wall. We used to not really have much at all. There were some really like jokes of offense, like around San Diego and, and uh, El Paso and whatnot. And now there's 650 miles, um, most maybe 700 miles now. I haven't looked recently. Most of it built before Trump was uh, elected. And it's very hard to imagine a, a how to build um, a political consensus around around dismantling that that already existing wall. I think we have the political force right now to stop new wall from being built if we if 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 even like a kind of like normal democrat wins power, but dismantling the 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 repressive apparatuses, I don't know if that's the correct plural, that 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 have been built over the last few decades seems very challenging. Yeah, so uh maybe one more question before we go to the um to the the questions that I have, um, you know, and, and it in a sense just picks up with your last point, which is um, if the the kind of lodestar, the thing that that we're we have in mind is like, what would it mean to actually think of the border not as a closed barrier, but as something that is a, a port of entry, where you have presumptive admission, you have it's decriminalized. And that there's a genuine commitment to freedom of movement and really to the the labor and political rights that should um, apply to all individuals, regardless of whether or not they're citizens. And so that's a that's a kind of emancipatory vision, and it's really um, an abolitionist politics mm. that um, treats uh, the question of immigration and the border as another site for contesting um, the rise of um, like a security apparatus to, to manage poor black and brown brown bodies. Um, a week ago, maybe this is a slightly more hopeful way of, of, of addressing this, I would have said that the immigration conversation and let's say the policing conversation were essentially in the same place, which is there's a growing sentiment within the Democratic Party that there needs to be reforms um, to the way that the police behave, that there are concerns about racism, um, sentiments about the fact that racism is like a major problem have um, grown pretty exponentially within the Democratic Party. But at the same time, there's the same kind of extreme polarization around the issue of policing and race um, that you within, uh, so a very different perspective among Republicans that you see in the immigration context. Um, and similarly, I would have said what you just pointed, which is, you know, maybe if you get a Democrat in charge, you can have some kind of minor reforms that limit the further, you know, ex uh, the further extension of the carceral system that attempt in some kind of limited way to, to contain policing, but you're not going to get anything more significant. But right now, um, on the table, both at the national level and at you know, across a number of different municipalities at the city level is a politics of defunding the police, um, diverting budgets uh, to community organizations and um, to to the sort of like the ec basic economic well-being of, of citizens, um, raising questions about the relationship between policing and incarceration. Who knows exactly where it's gonna go? Um, but that feels quite different than where the conversation was a week ago. And you know, what do you imagine as what will be required to, to have a similar conversation that's much more expansive about really the need to defund um, you know, border security and to transfer um, um, resources, to have the same kind of de-invest, reinvest conversation around immigration that we're starting to see emerge around policing and incarceration? So it seems like Dan got disconnected. And maybe we'll just uh, give him a moment to see if he can come back, that there might be issues around his uh, internet connection. I'll, we also have uh, a question that we'll get to, um, you know, as soon as we can get Dan back. So thank you, uh, uh, Daryl, um, for your question, which, uh, you know, I think is a perfect note, perhaps for us to end on. 
So Daryl's question is, how do we get these arguments across to the comfortable middle class who see themselves as liberal and hate Trump, but have nonetheless internalized the necessity for exclusionary borders? So we can all think a little bit about that and then Dan can sort of respond to that um, <clears throat> as a final question. Dan, are you back? So you can hear me. Uh, I can't. I can't hear you. Oh, connecting. Great. Ah, so Dan's telling us that uh, his phone died, um, and so so he's connecting right now. Just give us a moment. So it looks like um, it looks like Dan is actually going to have uh, uh, some technical issues being able to to come back on. Um, that there were uh, concerns about where he was um, and whether or not he could actually get internet connection on his computer, and that's the reason why he's using his phone. So I think what I'm going to do is I'll just um, take. Um, sort of Daryl's um, last question um, as, um, you know, um, as a as a note to end on. So, you know, this I think is a really interesting moment where we're seeing, so Daryl's last question again is, how do we get these arguments across to the comfortable middle class who see themselves as liberal and hate Trump, but have nonetheless internalized the necessity for exclusionary borders? Um, and, you know, I actually think that the moment that we're witnessing with policing is a really good parallel, where I think you'd have said basically the same thing about questions of race and incarceration, where the, the comfortable kind of liberal um, position had been, yes, racism is a problem, um, but at the same time, um, you know, a skepticism about um, the extent to which um, police mistreatment was really a defining issue and a kind of knee-jerk support for the police and security apparatuses, which is one of the reasons why it's been so difficult to actually reform um, um, uh, police practices, which is even local politicians in contexts where you don't have you know, very strong um, uh, collective bargaining agreements that limit what you can do to constrain police officers, um, local politicians were worried about whether or not going after the police would be something that was unpopular. And I think you can see the same thing right now at play in the immigration context, where there is opposition to the worst excesses of Trump's behavior, but actually having conversation about what would it mean to decriminalize the border feels like a kind of third rail. Um, it feels like you'd get accused not just by Republicans, but also by moderate Democrats of, you know, quote unquote, supporting um, open borders and whatever kind of like, you know, fantasies of threat that that entails. And, you know, I think that the only way to really shift that conversation is going to be through, you know, hard political work, which is um, organizing, making the arguments, even if they're unpopular, and then um, building um, both like
institutional power, but also, you know, test politics. It's not um, a coincidence that the May Day protests in 2006 were a significant turning point in how um, folks approached the question in the U.S. of, of immigration. It was a defining moment that, in a sense, um, pushed back against what had been the orthodoxy in the previous two decades. Um, it's also not a coincidence that um, the politics around um, uh, documented and undocumented um, immigrants in 2013, 2014, had a significant effect on uh, a growing base uh, within the Democratic Party. And this strikes me as, you know, the only kind of path forward. It's not one that's, um, you know, necessarily um, given, um, and it might be slow and hard, but I do think the fact that you now, for the first time really in decades, have something like a genuine kind of left political presence, um, both in kind of mainstream debate electorally with the individuals that were elected at the state level uh, on Tuesday that or that won their various primaries um, and in adjacent conversations about the security apparatus like the conversation around policing you know highlights the the potential for genuine shifts in the political center of gravity so um, you know I think that Dan's book, is very much like part of that conversation, which is explicitly and without apology, um, highlighting the continuities of nativism in American life, the way in which the bipartisan consensus participates in sustaining that, um, the, sustaining those destructive continuities and making arguments for the need for fundamental transformative change and not just reforms at the margins. That this isn't a question about, you know, moral largesse and better treating um, uh, f folks that uh, um, that appear for um, seem you know uh, seemingly surprising reasons to the American state um, you know it, at the border but the basic way in which the state has organized its labor policies its racial dynamics its demographic um, practices vis-a-vis um, -vis people from across the world but especially the global south and particularly Mexico um, so the only thing that we can do is continue forward with um, the same set of interlocking struggles and motivated by a kind of international sensibility for change. So with that, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Daniel, for your um, terrific um, book. And um, um, thanks again um, to everyone who participated in organizing this, but also who's uh, on the streets uh, fighting to make um, this a place um, uh, more worthy um, of uh, of all of us in the future. All right, take care.